from our studios in Los Angeles, here is Maria Shriver. Good evening. How much would you risk to do the right thing? Your job, your reputation, your family's well-being? Tonight, the story of a man, an insider, who risked all of that when he told secrets about his company, secrets that he believed revealed a terrible wrong. His actions would brand him a traitor, a rat, and worse. And that was just the beginning of a long and terrifying nightmare. Here's John Hockenberry. Hello? Hi, how you doing? Right, and that was okay with them? They were the picture okay. of a successful okay. American family. Oh, thanks so much. Bye -bye. When Rob and Dana Morena got married, they made their home in the quiet suburbs of Reading, Pennsylvania. They had two healthy children. The future looked bright for this successful company man and his high school sweetheart wife. We thought we made it. So how come the Morena's tranquil home life suddenly began to look like a family under siege? Oh, I was petrified. And I never, I really didn't let him know how scared. Because I always thought if I did, he would stop. He would just call quits. They began keeping to themselves, afraid to make phone calls from home. I even used phone booths and uh, different phones because I, I, I thought that they couldn't trace it back to who called them. Why were these people who outwardly seemed to have everything acting so strangely? I even told them to use an alias. An alias? What were they afraid of? My big fear was our protection. I mean, you never know. Well, there was many nights where I'd wait for him to go to sleep, and I would cry myself to sleep because I didn't know if we were going to make it. Who did you think was going to be hurt most by this? Our children. Because? Well, we would be financially devastated. Devastated because Rob Morena was trying to do what was right. It's hard to say. There was always a glimmer of hope that someone would think that I, what I did was the right thing. What Rob Morena did was become a nightmare for a $70 billion Fortune 500 corporation, where he was an exemplary employee with an impeccable nine-year work record. And this place was your life? Yes. The place was the clinical lab division of Smith Klein Beecham, one of the nation's largest, most prestigious laboratories. As a billing analyst, Rob Morena says he had a dream job. Well, I'm very technical. I'm very good with computers and you know, systems designs and working with people. And this, this type of job had all that. This job really sort of put all your talents together. Yes. But it was Rob Morena's special talents, the very talents that made his job an exciting challenge, that led him to discover something in the company billing procedures that troubled him. Do you remember a first moment when you looked at a sheet and said to somebody, hey, this, this, this can't be right? There were so many. It was an everyday occurrence. You'd be in meetings, and you start going over things, and you start saying, you know, this isn't right. You know, why, why are we doing this for this lab? Rob says numbers were not adding up. Are you sure all these charges are correct, he asked his bosses. But Rob says he wasn't getting any answers. I would mention them to management, bosses, different levels of management. And it was like, more or less, just keep quiet. And, and you know, that's how we operate and, and uh, you know, just continue to do your job. Rob was troubled because he says Smith Klein was billing the government for unnecessary and unauthorized work. Here's how. Rob says a patient would come in with a doctor's order for a blood test, which Smith Klein would do. But Rob says the company would perform additional tests neither the patient nor the doctor had requested. The more tests the company performed, the more it could bill the federal Medicare program. And the government was paying it all out of the pockets of the U.S. taxpayer. Medicare revenue to an organization is, is, is guaranteed money. It's not like billing a doctor. You know if you bill the government carrier, you're going to get paid. So how much money was coming in over the transom in some of these payments that you thought were questionable? In a given month, it could be tens of millions of dollars. He says it was just too much money to ignore. He had to tell someone outside the company what was going on. But who? He came upon a government 800 number set up for people to report just the kind of things Rob said he was seeing. The tough part, Rob says, was making the call. I was scared because I didn't know what would happen once I called this number. I mean, I was so naive in this whole process. Should he call? 
Well, as he looked around his office, he realized that blowing the whistle on the company would affect every one of his co-workers, his friends, and worse, it could destroy his family. I totally agreed with him. I told him it was his decision, and I would stand by him 100 percent. Dana Morena agonized with her husband as he grappled with his difficult decision. Did you have any idea what it would mean? No, we did not have a clue. I was afraid that if Smith Klein found out that he called this 800 number, he would be fired. Rob had worried that hordes of aggressive G-men would immediately knock on his door, declaring war on his employer without fail. Smith Klein would have to fire him then, Rob thought, but he couldn't just do nothing. He decided to pick up the phone. I had taken the kids and left the house so he could have some privacy to um, call. I remember dialing, getting the runaround. And when you say you got the runaround, what do you mean? They were just transferring me around to place to place. Incredibly, Rob says he found no tough investigators ready to spring into action. It was all just mushy confusion. Rob couldn't get anyone to listen. So even if you just said, look, there's fraud, it's millions of dollars, it's, I'd like to report it. They couldn't even deal with that. No one could help me. But by even making the call, Rob had already secretly declared war against Smith Klein. He felt he had no choice but to continue. He kept calling over several days until he finally found a man in the Philadelphia office of the Justice Department who listened to Rob and this time understood. He wanted to know more. I had an alias. Uh, I never gave him my name until later on in the process. Rob was feeling more and more like he was just one guy facing a team of Justice Department investigators and a giant corporation that would be outraged that he was telling on it. Rob had assumed that by making the call, his work would be done. He was discovering just how wrong he was. The government investigators wanted Rob to basically join their team to go undercover. Rob was worried. And so you thought it would be about as complicated as maybe reporting somebody double parked in front of your house? Yes. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that I report this, I get out of it. Really clean like that. That's what we thought. Where did you get the idea that that's how the government works? <laughs> I never dealt with the government before. <laughs> I never had an attorney before. And that ordinary life Rob and Dana Morena had come to know was about to change. Rob says he was told maybe he better get a lawyer of his own. But all he was concerned about is getting the information to the government. Attorney Mark Responti of Philadelphia and associate Dave Leger had taken many calls from whistleblowers before, but none quite like Rob Morena's. I guess what was different about it is that he never asked me, which most people do, about how much money he could make. Money? So whose idea was it you could make a bonanza reporting fraud to the U.S. government? Isn't that just being a good citizen? Well, it was this guy's idea, Abraham Lincoln. Honest Abe wrote the law to reward people for coming forward. It's called the False Claims Act, and it's still very much on the books. Lincoln was so fed up with being ripped off by suppliers during the Civil War, he wanted an army of private citizens to help stop fraud. Lincoln offered honest citizens 50% of whatever the government recovered. Today, the reward ranges from 15 to 25%. But in Rob's case, even 15% of what he suspected Smith Klein was improperly billing the U.S. Treasury would represent more money than the Morenas could imagine, tens of millions of dollars. When you made the first call to the government, did you have any sense that it could economically benefit you? No, no, none at all. Some people might think that the only reason you even did this was because, you know, it was a kind of a chance to win the lottery at the end. I was totally unaware of the whole whistleblower act until we got attorneys. And then they got a real education in how the system works. Rob and Dana discovered that this game had rules, and if they learned them, they might really have a big payday at the end of it all. But the stakes were high. Rob had to risk everything to help the feds, becoming, in essence, a government spy to make a case against Smith Klein. I told him that if you, if you moved forward, your life would never be the same. And we spent probably an hour and a half, David and I, trying to talk him out of moving forward. Rob's lawyers told him he would have to fight tooth and nail for any reward money. And by telling on his company, by becoming a whistleblower, they told him his life was already changed forever. Was it worth it to Rob to save the government some money it had never even missed until Rob discovered it? Rob made his decision. He was going to blow the whistle on Smith Klein. 
you were no longer on their team, right? Well, they didn't know that yet. But you knew it? Yes. Now, how did that make you feel? I, I felt like, like I was betraying everybody in this organization. When we returned... They said our attorney called and this is your last day, you're not going back. They knew their lives were going to change. They couldn't have known how much. Returning to our story, he was just a computer billing analyst, a guy with a family and a mortgage, who walked into a nightmare that would pit him against his own company and the federal government. He says the company was cheating the taxpayer out of millions. And when he alerted the government, he learned he stood to make millions if he simply blew the whistle. What he would learn is that there is nothing simple about that. Again, John Hockenberry. I felt like a traitor. It was, it was terrible. I was always looking over my shoulder. In November of 1993, Rob Morena became a spy. It began when he filed a false claims lawsuit against Smith Klein Beecham Clinical Labs. It meant he, in effect, became an informant against his own employer. His mission was to find hard proof of fraud and hand it over to the federal government, convince the feds that his claims were real, convince them to join with him in the lawsuit. And because his lawsuit was filed under a protective seal, he had to make his case without being discovered. Every day, Rob worried that his cover might be blown. Well, every little move that went on at work, I would always question, well, do you think they know about me? They didn't know about Rob, but by May of 1994, SmithKline Beecham Clinical Labs was on notice. They'd been hit with subpoenas demanding details, very specific details. Rumors of a mole were spreading. Rob wondered, could they possibly know it was he, that he was the one sneaking confidential documents out of the office, handing over names, dates, numbers? Were you worried that SmithKline might actually come after you? Just say, hey, he ripped off documents from our office. I was worried about everyone, yes. And for Rob and Dana, the slow pace of it all was agonizing. As the months dragged on, it seemed like nothing was happening. Rob says he was a very lonely man at work. He was doing all he could to keep a low profile. And though he was 15 months into the investigation, the government was still making no commitments about protecting his future. Then, in the spring of 95, with little warning, the case took a major turn. So, too, did Rob Morena's life. We had been notified by the government that they were going to partially unseal the complaint and show it to Smith Klein's attorneys. It meant disclosing some of the evidence they had so far, including their secret weapon, Rob Morena. Though he'd been warned that eventually the company would be told what he'd been doing for the government, Rob Morena left for work one morning, not knowing it would be his last. His wife, Dana, got the call from the lawyers. They said our attorney called in, this is your last day, you're not going back. In just one day, Rob walked away from nine years of his life. The company didn't like that he was a whistleblower, but they came to an accommodation with him. They worked it out so he can kind of quietly fade away. Rob says the government still wanted him to keep quiet, not talk to anyone about anything. His sudden absence looked worse than suspicious, though. People who had thought of him as a colleague and friend suddenly smelled a rat. Once I left, then the rumors started. Rob's the guy that was... And I had to lie and say, well, no, right. he's not. But whatever people believed at this point, Rob was not very employable. Throughout the industry, he could not find work, not even a nibble. For months, he lived off his severance with the hope that in the end, a possible reward settlement would save him from ruin. His role in the ongoing investigation grew even more significant. You were their star witness. Yes, and for a long period of time, I thought that I was their only witness. Rob would go and be a real-time uh, member of the team. As questions arose, they could ask him. He would be there. He'd provide answers. So he was, he was practically a deputy. Well, I mean, other than the fact that he had no badge, we saw him as part of the team. It could have fallen from the pages of a spy novel, a war room here inside a nondescript office building, a top secret operation, with Rob, the low key billing analyst, leading highly trained agents through a forest of documents. But as the wheels of justice plodded on, Rob Morena's situation was rapidly deteriorating. After several months, his severance was gone. The lowest point was around Christmas when we were, we were tapped out. Oh, that was horrible. 
because at this point, still, our children have no idea, and we don't know whether or not we'll be able to buy Christmas gifts. Rob, a college graduate, ended up taking odd jobs along the way. Handiwork, lawns, anything to get by. And all along, the Morena's million-dollar dreams of a cash settlement were fading. Rob and his wife had literally bet the farm that the government would not let them down. You were on the skin of your teeth. Oh, sure. And couldn't tell a single soul. Just me and him. Living on borrowed money. Mm-hmm. You know, looking at poverty. No, oh, sure. It was just, you know, one hurdle after the other. But perhaps the biggest hurdle of all, trying to get a handle on what the U.S. Justice Department was going to do. Would it join the case? Years into the investigation, with Rob working almost daily with the local agents, it was still technically just little Rob Morena versus the big corporation, Smith Klein Beecham Clinical Labs. Then in February 1996, a sweeping series of events that at first seemed to cut in whistleblower Rob Morena's favor. There was good news out of Washington, D.C. The government was joining Rob's lawsuit. And then, just days later, splashed across the headlines, Attorney General Janet Reno trumpets a record settlement with Smith Klein, $325 million. In the agreement, there was no admission of fraud, no wrongdoing on the part of the company. And in a statement to Dateline, Smith Klein Beecham indicated the decision to settle, quote, was driven by the enormous potential costs and uncertainties connected with what was expected to be lengthy litigation, which was, quote, simply too great a risk to our shareholders, employees, and customers. I got a phone call from my attorney, and he just, he, he gave me a number, uh, how much they settled for. Um, I felt great. Largest settlement in a medical fraud case in uh, U.S. government history. Yes. Felt good that we accomplished that. Rob Morena could finally hold his head up. After all, the government had publicly thanked him. Family, neighbors, and friends who had wondered what was going on now knew. Some of Rob's former co-workers at Smith Klein felt betrayed. I really never thought that they would take it to the extreme, that you'd be in stores and, and see them and they'd run from you. That happened? Oh, yes. yes. I guess we just didn't assume that they would really turn away. Are you a stool pigeon? I guess some people would say that. But he, in theory, was a very wealthy stool pigeon. According to the old False Claims Act, Rob Morena had a big payday coming from the U.S. government. Remember, he was entitled to receive at least 15 percent and perhaps as much as 25 percent of the $325 million windfall from Smith Klein. Rob and his wife Dana had done the math. It could mean as much as $81 million. After 15 lonely months, it was time for Rob Morena to collect. So after the settlement, it was time to go to the government and say, OK, remember us, right? Yes. And your attorneys did that? Yes. And the message they got back was? Whatever I did for the past two and a half years was irrelevant. The government was going to fight. Rob could hardly believe what he was hearing. I originally went into this case thinking that Smith Klein was going to be my enemy. Now all of a sudden it was the people in Washington, the government was my enemy now. And they were saying things that I knew were untrue. For starters, the Justice Department had a different formula. $10 million was all it was offering. But that didn't mean Rob Moreno would walk with a cool $10 million. Right off the top, half of this would go to taxes. Smith Klein agreed to pay some of the legal bills, but there were still more that Rob would be responsible for. What's more, the government argued there were other whistleblowers, but it would only pay one reward. Rob would have to work out a deal with at least two other whistleblowers who had given the government information in this case, or let the courts decide who would get the reward. I put all my time and effort into this, and the law is the law. And for that, Rob would be lucky to end up with even a million dollars, not much of a pension for someone in his 30s who now was virtually unemployable in his field. So Rob, along with his attorneys, decided to fight, to beat the Justice Department at its own game. He filed a lawsuit against the same people that were offering to make him a millionaire. Mr. Morena did not provide us with the information that was the basis of our fraud investigation that had begun in 1993. Joyce Branda is deputy director of the Justice Department's Civil Fraud Division. While the government doesn't deny Rob Morena's help in the investigation, it does dispute how much new detail he provided. 
That in turn, Brenda explains, determines the size of the reward. Your investigators in Philadelphia loved him, They've called him a hero. Why are you disputing this? We have always agreed that Mr. Moreno provided us substantial information on a certain portion of this case. Um, $10 million was the agreed upon reward, and that's a lot of money. And you consider that to be fair in this case? We consider it the appropriate award in this case. In fact, Dateline has learned the Justice Department, in an effort to settle with Rob Morena, had made an even bigger offer. According to Joyce Branda, he had turned his back on more than $22 million. Rob Morena was in the big leagues. From mild-mannered whistleblower, he had now become a formidable adversary to the U.S. government. If they played hard, Rob would play harder and hold out for the big money he believed he had coming. Did anyone say that the fact that you were fighting this, that you weren't taking what the government gave you, was a sign that it was greed that was motivating you? They didn't know the whole story, what we, what we went through for the past four or five years, what we risk, everything we risk. They just look at the end result. You know, they're treated like a skunk at a picnic on Sunday afternoon. They're unwell. From up on Capitol Hill, enter the cavalry, Republican Senator Charles Grassley, a longtime proponent of whistleblower laws and a powerful member of the Senate Judiciary Committee. He had heard about Robert Morena and the classic whistleblower runaround he was getting. The senator decided to take Rob's case up directly with Attorney General Janet Reno. He gave up everything professionally to help the government be successful in this case, and then I don't want some faceless bureaucrat just letting him swing in the wind. Is that what you told Janet Reno? I told Janet Reno that this person didn't have food on his table and that the government would not have had a case without his help, and why the hang-up? Just days later, Rob Moreno heard the news he'd been waiting on for months. The Justice Department was willing to pay up, but only a percentage of what it called undisputed funds. To get what he felt was his fair share, Rob would have to go to court. The dispute played out between teams of lawyers, dozens of witnesses, and thousands of documents in the longest court hearing of its kind. Our best weapon was the truth. It really came down to it, as corny as that sounds. Then, in April of last year, a judge finally ruled. The judge said the government was wrong. Rob Morena and the two other whistleblowers were entitled to a substantial settlement, $42 million. And that was on top of the undisputed money the government had already agreed to pay. Could it be that Rob's now more than six-year odyssey was finally nearing the end? Not quite. Today, more than six years after he first reported the fraud, Rob is still waiting. He's not bankrupt, though. There has been one $9.7 million payout shared among the three whistleblowers. But it's still a far cry from the tens of millions they thought, under the law, was rightfully theirs. We had the biggest case ever, and they're fighting us. I didn't go out and do this for the money. I did it to correct something that people used to say could never be corrected within that organization. This past August, Smith Klein Beecham sold off its clinical laboratory division. And the reason Rob Morena is still waiting for the money is because the federal government is appealing the case. The Justice Department told Dateline a decision could come any day now.